today to have a speaker and he came with great, great people that helped out in a tremendous way in their community, Rabbi Cohen from Eretz Israel. And David, I know, is a, a very strong believer in, in, in bringing out the best of Kral Yisrael. And he does that on every single turn he makes, he tries to bring out the great greatness of Kral Yisrael. David has came many times to the yeshiva to, te- to talk to the boys, and he, could, he will connect with you. Please give him your time of, and your attention, and um, don't, don't pull the lollipops on the floor. <laughs> See, it's a different crowd this year than the last time I was here. But whoever doesn't know me, my name is David Asulu. I was born in Brooklyn. I lived across the street here on Ocean Parkway and Avenue W. And uh, I went to school until I was 12 years old. I quit. I had to go to work and support my mother. My father was Mr. Leck when I was 12. So I went to work. I went, anything I had to do to get money, I did. Uh, I worked uh, selling the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper for five cents. In the 18th Avenue, where all the Tanyanis are, I used to go there and distribute newspapers. And maybe I used to make a dollar a week or so. A long time ago, this is 40 years ago, 50, I don't know. So from there, I went to the bowling alley. And the bowling alley, they used to have these pins made out of wood. I think they still have it today. And people bowl, and I was a pin boy. A pin boy is you sit up in the cage. When the bowling ball comes and knocks the wood, they go flying around. And my job was to take the pins that are on the floor and put them away till the next ball comes down. Most of the times the pins would go flying and I would have to hold my elbows up to, so you don't get hit in the head. These are big, heavy wooden pieces. And at the end of the bowling session, the boys used to throw a tip, a dime or 25 cents down the runway. And I used to make three, four dollars a day, so I quit the newspaper. Uh, and then I went to work in the store, sweeping the floor, and my life continued. When I was 14 years old, I opened my own store. 14 years old. How old are you guys? 17, 18. When I was 18, I had a brand new car, a Ford a Crown Victoria, and I used to have at least $20,000 in the trunk of the car in the safe when I was 18. When I was 14, I opened the store, and I had $60, and I went to the bank. It was an empty building. I told them I want to rent the store. They left. I mean, you see a little kid, 14 years old, wants to open a store in the bank building. Uh, so what happened? He said, what, what do you want to do? I said, I want to give you $60 a month, and I'll take the store. Every month, I give you $60. And that's... Something happened. Hashem told the president of the bank, give him the keys. He threw the keys on the desk. He says, go open the store. He said, but don't you put a nail in the wall because we're going to rent the store to someone in clothing, high class. We don't want any damages. So what I did, I was going to sell rugs. And I kept talking to Hashem since I was a child. I knew how to talk to Hashem. Somehow, I didn't learn that. I just knew it happened naturally every day. I used to say, Hashem, help me. So I rented these poles. They're made out of steel that the people used to paint high buildings. And uh, I rented the pole from the guy and to put the rug on the pole and lean it against the wall. This way there's no nails in the wall. And the first day I opened the store, I put an advertisement in uh, in the newspaper. They used to sell oriental rugs. And... The rugs cost $18. 
and I used to get shipments of rugs from the wholesalers. I don't know how they gave me credit. I guess just on uh, kindness. So I took a rug that cost $18 and I put it in the uh, newspaper for $15. Nine by 12 genuine oriental rug, $15. And I got an abbot from the street. I told him, take this rug and make it dirty and bring it back. He used to work in the store. And people used to come to the store the, the minute the air is on that day. Let's, I like to see the rug for $15. Now, I don't want to sell a rug that costs $18 for $15. I mean, that's not a good business, is it? So he dirtied the rug outside with mud and things like that. I said, that's the last one left. I said, and nobody wants to buy a dirty rug. So then I used to switch them to another rug, $30, $100. And the first day, I sold $10,000 in the store. I immediately called up the Ford company and I ordered a brand new car and I told them to deliver it to the store. In those days, everything was easy, not like today. Everything is computerized. You didn't need credit, nothing. I told the guy, come, I'll give you the cash. They brought the car now. The first day in business, I'm 13 years old or so. I'm driving a brand new car. I don't have a license. And then time went by. I was uh, living in Brooklyn. There was a lot of goyim. So either he had a Syrian Jewish friend or a goy. That was it. So when I was in school, I went to Setlow Junior High School. They uh, voted me sergeant at arms, president of the seventh grade. And the Tenyanis made signs in the schoolyard, vote for David Asul. And I don't even know who told them to make the sign. I didn't even know if I'm running. For, for like president of the seventh grade. And little did I know, the Talianis wanted me to be the president of the seventh grade so I could go into the gym, get all the basketballs and all the baseballs and the gloves and give it to them and let them play ball in the park. And chairs and all these things. They needed favors. And they knew that I was the guy because I knew a lot of Goyim. And that was a very dangerous time in my life. Now, my best friends became Goyim. And the Goyim, I don't know if you ever heard, years ago in Italian neighborhoods and Jewish, they used to beat up the Jews and uh, it, wasn't so, it wasn't so easy for, for an Italian guy to look at a Jew who has a dollar in his pocket, he's buying ice cream and lollipop, and they don't have a quarter, they don't have a penny. So that was a little difficult. I used to have to protect the Syrians. And we used to tell them, these are my people, don't, don't touch them. And life went on that way, and I escaped from the Goyim. It came to a point, they said that I was a rabbi when I was about 17, because I started to know about religion. And they wanted me to be in the shul to, to run uh, a bazaar, you know, gambling. We used to have it in churches, and in, and in synagogues, they used to have buildings where they run these uh, dice games and gambling casinos and everything in the building, and budgets. Uh, so one of them came to my house, and he brought $2,500 cash, and he said, just sign this paper so that we could get a shul in Staten Island. And you're the rabbi of the shul. I said, I'm not the rabbi. We heard you're a rabbi. Because they saw all of a sudden, uh, you know, I'm going to shul on Shabbat or something. So they made me, they elected me to be the rabbi, the Goim. So sign this paper. Every week we'll give you $2,500. Why do I have to sign the paper? Because... There had to be somebody in charge running this gambling thing. So if a rabbi was in charge, it's okay. Well, I have deal, a priest, it's okay. You needed someone of uh, importance that's going to run and make good for the gambling. It's like donations, it was, but it wasn't donations. So I didn't sign the paper. It was very difficult to turn them down. You know what $2,500 means? In, uh, 50 years ago, let's say. It's like you, call, you could buy a, a almost 
you put a deposit on the house. $2,500, you definitely could buy a brand new car. And I turned this money down. They couldn't believe it. How's this guy turning the money down? So I realized Hashem is running the world. And I also realized this money is no good. It's tomorrow. I can't go on a thing like this because I'll wind up being very close to the mafia. And, and these people, once you get involved with the goyim, you, you can't get out. If they do you a favor, you're stuck for life. Once you become taking money from them and working with them, that's it. They own you. And I knew this. So time went by, Baruch Hashem, I stayed away from them and I went into business and I had my own store. I used to work when I was 13. I went to Virginia, or 14, Virginia Beach, Virginia. I worked seven days a week, seven nights. I got up eight o'clock in the morning and opened the store, and I didn't leave the store till 12 o'clock at night, every single day. I had to make money, I have to support my mother. And this is a summer resort, you can't, whoever heard closing on shops, that's impossible, impossible. You know, this, especially weekends in, in, a, in a summer resort, Saturday is one of the biggest days, Saturday and Sunday. So time went by, Baruch Hashem, I met my rabbi, Ali Shalom, Rabbi Yisli Ali Rosenfeld, he taught me the Torah, he taught me everything I know, and he taught me how to teach other people, and before you know it, we were selling mezuzot to everybody, we were selling tefillin, to people that never wore Tiffany. We had Mezuzot, we sold the ones that were married, Mezuzot, and we had Sisi, we sold Sisi, we, we sold more Sisi than Tiffany and Mezuzot than any three stores in Brooklyn. Because we had the power, he had the power of having a class, and we used to push people to wear Sisi and Tiffany. So time went on, and life goes on, and you realize Everything you do is from Hashem. There's nothing you could do that you could make up that said, I did it. Nobody could say, I did it. You did nothing. Hashem gave you the koa. Hashem gives you life every morning. You say, more adir, more adir, ani. Hashem has given you life. Now it's up to you to use it in the proper respect. I was tougher than any kid in this class, I'll tell you that. There was nobody I was afraid of. I was called, I was considered one of the toughest kids in Brooklyn. Me, an Ashkenaz friend of mine, and an Italian friend of mine. His name is uh, Johnny Martino. He's in the movies, uh, The Odd Father. If any guys ever heard of that movie, it's with a G instead of Odd. So, and I was gonna be in that movies also. His father was a mafia guy. They wanted me to be in that movies. That's still playing today, 10 series, 100 series. So you can understand, Hashem doesn't expect everyone in this classroom to be like Rabbi Cohen, sitting here with a beard and seat, <coughs> learning Torah every day, going out and doing his work. He's now working on building a hospital in Israel, him and my friend Bobby Rosenberg. And not everybody's designed to do a certain thing. You could be a Baal Korea. You could probably be a Hazan. The other guy could be a rabbi. The other guy could be a, a tycoon in the business. My friend, Ma Morris Bailey, he used to ask me to sell scooters in, in Coney Island. Scooter rides, it was 10 cents. We used to, he used to buy the uh, motors, the little so school, and you go around the thing, 10 cents a ride. He asked me to be partners to do that. Then he went into the uh, Burger King business. He sold hamburgers. Burger King, and, and he had a kosher king, then he closed out in Coney Island, then they went to the Goyim Burger King, then he owned them, before you know it, 100 stores, 500 stores. Today, Mars Bailey, Baruch Hashem, Shlita, a dear friend of mine, he's worth over $4.5 billion. And he was born in Brooklyn, just like you guys are here. He was also here. He was one of you kids. And so was all of us. Some of us went on to do different things. Morris Bailey, for example, they bring me, we brought him up. He built the center on Ocean Parkway. He changed the whole uh, Brooklyn to go into the center and do these things, and the gym and the basketball and swimming. 
So he, was, he wasn't a Hasid guy, but he was one of the community. I built five shuls in my lifetime. Who would ever believe? Uh, I was a gangster, and, and he's a guy. Built five synagogues? How could that be possible? Where did I, I don't have the money. Where did I get the co-op? All from Emunah. All from the Zechut of Hashem. So everyone sitting here now should know, you are here for a purpose. What the purpose is, only you know. Hashem is going to put you in a position where you're going to say, ah, oh, this is what I want to do. If I ask everybody in this room right now, what do you want to do? I don't think three people are going to give me an answer. What do you want to do when you get older? Me? Yes. Yeah, you. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I become a software developer. Excuse me? Become a software developer. Okay, and you? Well, oh, that's one out of three knows something. So you, you, I guess everyone knows the answer. I'll tell you what my rabbi said when I was younger. He said, go into computers. A computer, people didn't even know what the name was. He said, go into the computer business. It's a great thing. And thinking this morning, what I'm going to say to you kids, or gentlemen, or rabbis, the computer business is not finished. People are making millions and billions of dollars in software. If you have the ability to learn, to work on a computer, even now while you're going to school, sitting here, if you know it, you could be making money. Did anybody realize that? While you're sitting here now, you could have a business making you money. It's unbelievable. For 20 years, I'm asking my children, go get these computers, put something on there, and let's sell it. And it was hard. And one time I convinced them, and we made... Thirty, forty thousand dollars in a few months in the in the computer. What is a computer? What do you do? You sell something. You get an item, you put it on there. The ladies are doing it. They're wearing used clothing. They put it on the computer. It's, the world is crazy. They're buying used clothing. They're buying shoes. It costs a thousand dollars retail. They wear it, and then it has red on the paint on the bottom of the heels, which means it's a thousand or more. And they sell it for two, three hundred dollars after they finish wearing it, and other people are buying the shoes. So there's, there are housewives making a thousand, two thousand a week on a computer. So someone here certainly knows about a computer. I guarantee you that. Someone could think of any item that somebody wants and go get it. You get it wholesale. You don't buy it. You go to somebody. Here's Joe Schwartz. You sell cameras, for example. He sells cameras. I like to buy cameras. You get a picture of all the cameras. You don't buy anything. You put it on the computer. All of a sudden, someone calls your, your website, whatever it is. I have no idea. And they ask you how much or the price is there. Give me this camera. Okay. You call up Joe Schwartz. Give me this camera. You mail it to the guy. You did nothing. All you did is made a, a website or a store on the computer. Like an ad. An ad. Whatever you want to call it. That's, that's one idea. But everybody could do something. There's people in here could build homes. You could be in construction. You could be teachers. You could be whatever you want. The thing is, what makes you comfortable? That's what you have to do. Now, I was here the last time. There was different people, uh, different Talmudim. Before, so I could say this again, that I, uh, we took a store. My son and I wanted to have a store in a hotel. And I'm repeating the story for a reason. And in the hotel, it was very hard to get into this hotel. Very high class place. And you have to be someone really, you know, with a big bank account and sell the best merchandise. We passed all that stage. We got to the table with the lawyers and they're giving me the lease, signed the lease. So I pick up the pen and I look, I said, what does this say here? And it says in the lease, you must open on Shabbos. The store cannot be closed on Saturday. In the lease. I worked eight months for this lease, and all of a sudden, boom, you got to open on Saturday. I looked at my side. I said, can you believe this? The Satan jumped into the lease here. What kind of thing is this? They're making you open the store on Shabbat. He says, well, what can we do? I, you know, I says, we're going to sign the lease. So we signed the lease. This is two years ago. Of course, the first Shabbat we closed. The second Shabbat we closed. Every Shabbat we closed for the last two years. Baruch Hashem, Hashem helped us. They never complained. 
They never said it. it's in the lease you have to open. And the Hiddush is to show you everything's from Hashem. Just last week they complained about our store, that it was open. So I told my son, what, somebody's hallucinating. What are they talking about? No, we opened on the Shahwari, on Exmas. And they wanted us to be closed because too many people come to the hotel and use the bathrooms and they need a lot of security and we were supposed to be closed. They don't open on Exodus. All the stores had to be closed. Your store was open. This is a complaint. On a, it was a Thursday or a Sunday. I don't remember what day. But to show you how things can get mixed up. But if you have the foresight, if you have the emunah, let them say what they want. Now they want us to close on a, on a Sunday. We're not closed. I'm building a house now, refurbishing a house. The contractors, they don't work on Shabbat. And all of a sudden, we got a complaint from the, 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 the license department. You cannot work in this house when it's condemned, boom, no, stop labor, everything. What's one of the biggest complaints? We worked on Sunday from 8 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. And this is Asur. So you understand this country is crazy. We're not allowed to work on Sunday building a house. We're not working on Shabbat. So, of course, you go to court, you fight them, and the, the, the fighting today is easy for everything. We beat all the satans up. We did that already. So you tell them, we're showing the Shabbos, this and that, and then they give you permission. But the original thing is you opened on Sunday, and here also we worked on Sunday. And it's so, coincidental, nothing is coincidental, that these two items happened to us within 30 days. These two complaints, <laughs> we opened on Sunday. So now you know you're really strong. Now you know you're on the side of Hashem. When they start picking on the mizvot that you do, close on Shabbos, open on Sunday, you know this is the satan. So everyone in this room has to know nothing is easy. When Hashem said to us, you got to work, to the sweat of your brow, and I'm going to ask the rabbi also to interpret a few things in Hebrew. He uh, happens to be very learned from Eretz Israel. And I respect them. He's building a hospital. They're my guest today. And I thought it would be nice for them to come. Uh, you have to understand, anything you want to do, you could do. Don't ever get depressed. Depression is from the satan. We have remedies. You go to a doctor, you're depressed, the guy gives you a shot, or he can tell you to have a drink. We have better than that. We have a certain 10 chapters of Tehillim. It's called Tikkun Klali. If you are depressed, read these 10 chapters, and you won't be depressed anymore. If you're depressed, Rebbein Nachman says, have hit what to do, talk to Hashem every day, 10 minutes, 20 minutes a him, at least one hour a day. But you can't do it an hour a day. It's very difficult. So start 10 minutes. Try it. Hashem, I want to play ball today. We have a basketball game. I want to win. You can ask Hashem that. Nothing wrong. You can ask Hashem everything. Everything you can ask Hashem. There's no, not like being a nudge. You, Hashem is waiting to hear from all you guys. I know you're sucking on the lollipops, you're fooling around here. If I was here, you guys, I would get a strap. In the old days, I went to yeshiva for six months. Uh, before school, or after school, the rabbi had a stick like this. Rabbi Ezra Mishani, Rabbi Shalom. And you, everybody has to read. And you have to have your finger on the place. He gets up. Asunim, where's the place? I don't know where the place is. I'm not even reading. So you put your finger there. Boom, he tries to hit your finger with the stick. I, he never hit me. I always got my finger away. But he hit the other kids. And he was a good enemy. He'd throw a stick and hit you right in the head with it. And he'd say, no junk express. Locomotive. What does he mean, no junk express? When you read, he don't want express like the, the trains. He used to say, no junk express. Locomotive, and he slow each word separately. The marvelous thing in the world, and one of the greatest things in my life, and I think you should all know this, and one day I got a thought that the world is in big trouble, and the Arabs are stabbing Jews, and ISIS, and Shmaisis, and all this Yisurim, this Balagan, this is a decree from Hashem, is a certain kind of thing that I say it's cleansing. Hashem is cleansing the world. Like a person makes sins, he has to make tissue back, he has to cleanse, he has to go to the mikvah. 
talk to Hashem, I'm sorry, I thought the Avita Pashat me. And this, this is cleansing. Hashem is cleansing the world before the Mashiach comes. There's no question about this. So I had a thought that the whole world should say Tikkun HaKlari, which is uh, 10 chapters of Tehili. So I said to myself, sorry, I said to myself about two months ago, wouldn't it be wonderful, I try to calculate all the Jews in the world, wouldn't it be wonderful if five million people could read the Tikkun HaKlari, the 10 chapters of Tehillim, together at the same time. Open one big shul, five million people. How do, you, how do you do something like this? So I said to myself, we start at the court of Lema at eight o'clock at night. Eight o'clock at night, what time is it in Brooklyn? One. One o'clock in the afternoon. So we started at eight o'clock at night in Yerushalayim. One o'clock in Brooklyn, they were saying to him, even a lot of yeshivas, and a lot of kolels, and we don't know. I said five million people. We really don't know how many million people read this. Denmark, all Europe, Iran. Iran, every country was giving us questions. Can you make the Tikkun Kholi in their language? And 10, 20 minutes before we were going to read it in Israel at 8 o'clock at night, we get a text that they wanted in. Uh, they want to, in Venezuela, they want it in Spanish, in Brazilian, to, to convert the, the Hebrew words to, to, to Spanish. So we had all languages on this, Italian, American, French. And what do you think happened? I called Bobby Rosenberg, he called the rabbi. The rabbi Cohen went to the rabbi of the court in Ma'aravi. And they waited two weeks before we got permission. And thank you, Rabbi. I don't know if we ever thanked you before. I thank you publicly. He got the court de Rama Arabi to give us permission to say Tikkun HaKlali only at the court de Rama Arabi at 8 o'clock at night. Now, this is unbelievable. We have permission. At this time, they were giving us a very hard time the police, the ambulance, and all the people that guard Israel said, you can't have this happen because we cannot have crowds. They're stabbing people, we can't, crowds are just arouse the Arabs, and we, how can we could control 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people? So they stopped the buses coming to Eretz Yisrael at the courtyard, about seven o'clock, six o'clock, they wouldn't let any buses come near it. We had our own buses, coming in from different places, from Hebron, from Rabbi Arusha Shishiva. But the bottom line is, we took off, we said the Tikkun HaKlali Baruch Hashem, we said it on the microphone, Bobby Rosenberg, he has the film of the story, said this Tikkun HaKlali together. So we had, let's say, not five, a million, whatever, hundreds of thousands, we had the biggest shul in the world. Now, who could ever do that? This never was in anybody's mind since Adam and Who Whoever thought you could have the whole world praying? Who, whoever thought you could have millions of people praying? Where did I get this thought? I'm not a rabbi. Where did I get this thought? But when you work diligently and you have feeling and you have emunah, somehow through the shikhut of the sadiqin, of your parents, Hashem will give you the berachah. And I want to say thank you, whoever did say it. Everybody I saw today in the bris, they're all thanking me. They read the, one lady came, she wants a copy of uh, what we did at the court there. It was unbelievable. Another lady's crying. Another guy in a wheelchair, Bobby Rosenberg, he never said that he could not tell in Israel. The guy was crying his head off. He finally saw the light. So this Tehillim that we read helped so many people. And I earnestly believe that we stopped a lot of killings from this prayer. What I'm getting at is, whatever you want to do, you could do it. Don't get depressed and don't feel I can't do this, I'm tired, I, I'll never succeed. That's, that's for the satan, all that talk. Is everybody with me here? Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. I just don't want to take too much time because this is unexpected uh, class that we're having. But I want to ask Rabbi Cohen if the rabbi doesn't mind, because he's a rabbi of Yerushalayim, and they have extra special uh, kedushah. Maybe he could say just a few words. We'd appreciate it. These kids got to go to work. They got to. They got to. They got to learn. They got to know about Shabbat. They got to know everything. So I don't know how you're going to say it in three minutes or five you, minutes. You said it all already. <laughs> I'll try to get it about Torah. You have a chumash, chumash Bamidba? With uh, Orachayim? You have Orachayim? Mikrot Gedolot. Bamidba. You see now, you see if this was my class, and the rabbi's going up to get that book, all you guys get chopped out, the black guys that give you all. How do you let him get up? To the, you should get up. I want to tell you something. Listen to me. In one of our classes, Rabbi Rosenfeld said, Olivia Shalom, if a person needs blood, if a person is, has to have plasma, it's emergency. Everybody in this room, let's say it's Shabbat Kodesh, everybody in this room is listening. There's an emergency. Somebody needs blood. Go to the nearest drugstore or the hospital and get class A blood for this person. What do you think you're supposed to do? People used to say years ago, you can't drive on Shabbat. You can't. But if it's saving a Jewish life, you could drive on Shabbat. So he says you drive on Shabbat. You go to the hospital, whatever it is, and you get the blood. So that's very good. But he says, not one person. Everybody got to get up. Each, if everybody has a car, everybody go and get it together to get the same item. Now, what if you get it first? It, the question is, what if you don't come back? What if you didn't get it? Somebody's going to bring it back, you know, for sure. So everybody did not break Shabbat. He was doing the mitzvah. Here, the rabbi went upstairs now. You guys should know. You're so lucky to have a rabbi like this. Don't think rabbis let you come in their, in their yeshiva and talk. Believe me, they're jealous. I'm telling you that. Sometimes when I talk, some rabbis, they get a little, little banged up. What is this guy doing? Ba, ba, ba. You know, it's, uh, it's giving your chabor the way a little bit. But he loves you so much, and he thinks so highly of what we do, or what we stand behind, and how we do it, that he invites me here to speak, which I'm not a speaker. This is the first place I spoke, and I'm back again, and I said it the other day. I had him speaking on the radio with 150,000 people listening. The thing is, you should show more respect for the rabbi. You see, I watched him. He went to get the chair from up, up there, bring it down himself. You guys are sitting down. That's not the way I learned. I learned you get up and you run, and you let him sit down, and you get the chair, you get the harness, you get the lollipop, whatever it has to be. He's the boss. He's the boss. You guys, what do you think you are? You're in the... You're in the you're in a hotel here, or in a suite, you're ordering room service, you have a rabbi, you have to respect the rabbi like a sefer to that. He's a walking sefer to that. And he wants to help you more than you want to get help. And the ones who resist should have second thoughts about that. Should have second thoughts. The ones who, who answer them nasty, and he's not here, I can say this. You have to ask him, Mechila, forgive me. And you see, the more respect you have for the rabbi, the more respect Hashem is going to have for you, and the more successful Tell you guys will be. Tell him I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll be all right without it. Oh, can I say oh. See, now when he comes in, everyone should oh. Hello? <laughs> so, yeah, hello. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to tell him a story. Years ago, in Brooklyn. No, but I can't. I'll wait for books and stuff. I'll wait. Rabbi, I'm not a book guy. Years ago, there was a question. If you're if you're a shami. You can't go out with my daughter because she's a halab. Uh, true. I'm Lebanese. So what happened? One time, one time, a guy, a girl, and a guy they want to get married. A sham in the halabi. 
It was like Chas Shalom, the worst thing that happened to both families. Baruch Hashem, today they have more, more the sense. You know, you're Jewish, we're Jewish, they would come from the same kind, we're cousins, we're brothers, whatever you want to say. So because you're a Shami, what are you, a Shami or a Hanabi? Both. Okay, well, forgive me. Okay, here's the rabbi. He will say a few words. You know, after I heard this last, this last. Uh, little discussion about the different types of uh, Jews that are in this yeshiva. I'm, I'm uh, thinking of saying something else, but for the chvod of the Rosh Hashiva that went to get me the chumash, so I'll start, I'll start with what I, what I thought of saying uh, when I heard the Mr. Asulin say something, one idea that he brought up, and maybe at the end I can end off about the shamis and the chalabim and all different types, because everybody, a Jew is a Jew, it doesn't matter where he's from. Um, in Parashat Baalotcha, Baalotcha, so there's a story of the Slav. I'm sure you've all learned Chumash many times. You know the story of the Slav, that the Bnei Yisrael were in, were in, the, in the Midbar, in the desert. I'm going to tell you in a moment. And they left Mitzrayim, they left Egypt, and they, all the food that they got came from Hashem, from Yashamayim, came from the heaven. They ate something called Mon, right? They didn't have food. In the, in, the, in the desert, they got mon. Every morning they went out, there was, a, there was a miracle, and there was mon waiting for them on the ground for 40 years in the desert. That's what they ate. But there were a lot of people who didn't appreciate that. And they said, we want to have all the good things like we used to have in Mitzrayim. It was so great for them in Mitzrayim. They were slaves. They were being beaten. But they, when they were out in the Midbar in the desert, they said, oh, we want to have, we remember the fish and the watermelons, I'm saying from the post that it says there. Zachano is Adoga. And the and the kishuim and the avatichim, they had a great time there. They had fish and and and, and watermelon and and uh, shum and, and onions. Okay, that was uh, maybe today it would be steaks and uh, hot dogs. But uh, I'm getting to that. So they said we, we want to have meat. We want to have meat. We don't want to eat this mud all day. They were complaining. They were complaining. They were looking. They were looking to complain because they weren't happy with themselves or whatever it was. So Moshe Rabbeinu goes to Hashem. What am I going to do? Hashem says. You think I can't give you meat in the desert? You're going to get meat. You're going to get it. Don't worry. And he sends slov. Slov is like a big, a big uh, swallow. What is it called in English? A quail. A quail. That's the word. Thank you. A big, Who big bird. Oh, <laughs> He's yours? Wow. Okay. A quail. The quails are going to come, and you're going to have so much. You're going to. You're going to. You're not going to have what to do with it. So. It says like this, but Hashem tells Moshe something very, very interesting. We don't find this very often in the Torah, that Hashem dictates to Moshe exact words to say. He says like this, Tell to the people, tell to the nation, Make yourselves holy for tomorrow. Rashi explains that when we say to somebody, make yourself holy, his is not a good thing. It means it's going to be a problem. This is something of, 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 of a dangerous nature that's going to happen. And you're going to eat meat. You're going to get these quails coming. And then listen to what Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu. Because you cried. You cried in the ears of Hashem and you said, Who's going to feed us meat? Because it was good for us in Mitzrayim. And there's a whole long dictation afterwards, you're not going to have it for a day, it's 20 days, it's going to be a whole month long, etc., etc. But this is very interesting, and Hashem is dictating these words. The Orachayim HaKadosh points out something very interesting. It's, it's important that we understand that Hashem is dictating these words. But why did He choose these words? Every word of Torah, every word of the Torah is very important to understand what Hashem is teaching us. What is the message of the fact that he says that Hashem tells Moshe, tell them you are crying. Ki bechisen, you cried. But what's the problem with crying? We find many times in Torah crying. So he says like this. He says, not just the crying is the problem, but mi yachi who can feed us? They said, who can do it? The Or Chaim says that if it was just a child who was father, 
like Mr. Asu mentioned, Hashem is Avinu Shabbat Shemayim. Hashem is our father. Hashem is our father. Hashem is our mother. Sometimes he, he, he acts to us like a mother, sometimes like a father. Hashem is for us for everything. What if a child wants something from his father? So he cries to his father, Tata. Daddy, I want something. I need something. I want to have steak night. We want to have a barbecue. That's not so terrible. You can say yes, you can say no. But why is that so, so in, in, in important to Hashem to say that you, you were crying to Hashem? And not only were you crying, but you said, Mi achilein bosa, who can give us meat? We're out in this desert getting this, this lechem kloikel, this, 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 this tasteless mun that we're being served. It's, it, it's a miracle coming down every morning. You go out and you find it. But they, they were trying to find fault. They were complaining. So the Orach Haim HaKadosh says that if they would have just said, Moshe, you know, we love the man, it's a miracle, but we, we'd like to have once a week Sunday nights a barbecue. That, that, Hashem wouldn't be upset about that. You want to ask for something? You can ask for something. I can give it to you. I won't give it to you, but you're allowed to ask. The problem was not that. The problem was that after they had left Mitzrayim and they had seen all of the miracles that Hashem had done for them, Split, uh, of course, all the makas that were done to, to, to Paroi and split the sea and everything, and they got the tyrant, all this. And you're still complaining, who can do this for us? Who can bring us basar? The Orachayim HaKadosh says that it's like kfira. It's like an apikairis. He uses the word kfira, Hashem. It's like you don't believe in Hashem what at all. And that you've given up. He says yiush. Like Mr. Sulan mentioned, yiush is giving up. Becoming depressed and giving up. The Orachayim says that is, the, that is what made Hashem upset. That is what Hashem says, we don't have that. In Yiddishkeit, in Judaism, a Jew never gives up. There's no such word as Yiush as giving up. It's hard. You can try this, you can try that. You can uh, go through all your different hardships, but a Jew doesn't give up. And we find in the next parsha after that is parsha Shlach with the Maraglim, and that's also... We have also there, they were crying, Oi, Hashem, what are we going to do? How are we going to go into Israel? There's these, these big, great giants. We're not going to be able to, to go in there. We all know what happened after Chetam and Aglim, after the spies went in and came back and told Moshe that we can't do this. That's when they ended up staying in the Midbar for those 40 years. Everybody who was there who complained died. Hashem said, Atem bechisem bechiyel You're crying a, 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 a cry for no reason because I can do everything for you. You don't believe in Hashem enough. You're going to have a Bechil, a Deiris. That day became Tishabov, the day that we cried for the Beit HaMikdash, Arishon Vashani, the two Batim Mikdash were destroyed on, on, uh, on Tishabov. That was the day that the Jews cried in, in, the, in the desert because they're afraid that Hashem can't help them enough. So it's an amazing, amazing lesson, lesson that we have to learn. A Jew never gives up, no matter how hard it is, no matter what I've done wrong. A person person can do it, the worst of errors, he thinks it's the worst of errors, whatever they are, he's still a child of Hashem, and he's still, Hashem is waiting, just like a father is waiting for his son to, 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 to be part of the family, to come back to the family, no matter how miserable he was, no matter how nasty he was, a parent, we hope, a parent should always tell his children how much he loves them, and they're always welcome in his home. The same is true with Hashem. We're always welcome in front of Hashem, no matter what we do. No matter what we've done, no matter what we think, we can do tshuva, we can be close to Hashem, and even if sometimes there are things that we can't do right away, things are hard, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever, whatever in your note, whatever tests that each one has, everybody knows what's going on inside, everybody knows what he does, what he doesn't do, what he thinks, what he feels. I'm not coming here to say one to the other, everybody knows what they have to fix, what they have to work on. But, if, if I can't do everything, I throw it all away, that's not the Jewish way. Hashem is waiting for us. Hashem knows that we're here and cares about us. And if we, if we hold on, you know, at the time of Mashiach, which I think we're in, we've been in for a while, it doesn't happen overnight, and the time of Mashiach, as I'll tell us, is going to be like a wire. And the Jews are going to be holding on to that wire, and Hashem is going to shake it like this. It's going to be shaking up and down. Imagine you're holding on to a wire for dear life, and it's shaking. Who's going to be Zoycheh to see Mashiach? The ones who hold on, even with one finger. You don't have to hold on with the whole hand. You're holding on however you can. But if you hold on, and you believe in Hashem, and you believe in the mitzvahs, so how much you can do, 
more or less, whatever it is, you don't throw it away, you don't walk away from it, and you never give up. Those are the people, those are, those are us. When, we, when the Chazal always talk about tzaddikim, in the time of Mashiach, tzaddikim, who are they? The ten guys, excuse me, I'm sorry, the ten Rosh Hashivas, the ten big rabbis who sit up front in the Mizrach, upstairs on the stage. Those are the ten tzaddikim, what about everybody else? What about all the rest of the Jews? No, the tzaddikim are us. The tzaddikim are the ones who go to yeshiva, who go to shul every morning, or even just on Shabbos, who put on tefillin, who keep Shabbos, who eat kosher. Those are the tzaddikim because compared to everybody else, everybody else is out there, threw away his Yiddish guy, threw away his Judaism completely. We are the tzaddikim. So we want to stay close to Hashem, whichever way we can, more or less, it doesn't matter. But ne never throw it away. Keep growing and growing, and we'll all be zoiche to see Mashiach, and you should all have a lot of hasloch and brocha. Uh, eulogy. He said to me this morning, I said something in the eulogy, he says, if I said it over 100 times, the story that I said. He said, he says, you can't get over the story. But we're going to leave that on the side. We're going to go to the story that might be applicable to you tough guys here, especially the guy down the stand. Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Just two more minutes. Two more minutes. So uh, being in business, I'm in the retail business. We sell diamonds. So the rabbi likes the story. We'll say it again. So the lady comes in the store. She, uh, she has like four or five guys waiting outside. Detectives, you know, with the earplugs. So either way, you know that this is an important lady. So uh, she happened to be the princess of Saudi Arabia. So I showed her some jewelry, and she looked at some things. She said, I'll be back, and all this. She stalled around for two weeks. She drove me crazy. I waited at night for her to come. She said, I'll be there at 8 o'clock. She doesn't show up. The secretary calls, she'll come tomorrow. And I have a friend that's Italian. He said, what are you taking all this abuse from this Arab lady? Let her go, as says there, what are you? Going there, she don't come, you come. I said, listen, there's a possibility she could buy something. What do I lose? He says, yeah, but she's insulting you. I said, well, let's, see, let's hear the end of the story, then I'll agree. Finally, one day, she came, and she made a purchase. She made a check. She didn't make a check. She ordered her secretary to send a, uh, a bank uh, transfer for $2 million. Wow. She bought a big diamond for me, amongst other things. Uh, that's a big sale, $2 million. Mm -hmm. If you make only a little percentage, you're making a lot of money, right? So I said, these people have money coming out of the ground. Hashem gave them money, it's oil wells. Two million is nothing to her. Tomorrow she's gonna get another 10 million from the ground, from the oil. Every day they're gonna get it. So uh, we followed up, we spoke to her, and then she says, I'm leaving to California. I said, I wanna show you the other items. And of course, I'm trying to sell them more. Wouldn't you try to sell them more? Yeah. Would that be? 1,000%. So I tried. My chef says, you got to do the ishtakos. you got to try. So I tried, and she says, I'm going to California. Uh, I'm gonna, I said, okay, maybe I, I'm coming to California also, which I wasn't. But now that she's going to California, I'm going to California. What hotel? I found out the hotel. That's the same hotel I'm coming to. I'll be there. I'll meet you in the hotel. She says, okay. So it happened to be the hotel is right next to my cousin's shoe, right in the backyard. And the Sephardic Shore in Beverly Hills. So look, try to make this short. She picks out an abundance of items and she says, I'll let you know tomorrow night. I says, uh oh. Tomorrow night is Friday night. I can't do that. I'm not gonna be here. I said, I have a, an appointment. I says, she says, Who do you have an appointment with? Who's more important? 
She was insulted. I said, I have an appointment with the king. She thought I meant to say the king, her father. <laughs> I'm talking about Hashem, I have an appointment. Friday night, I'm not going to be waiting for her to look at the merchandise with clothes, Baba. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'll leave the stuff here with the concierge. You'll look at it. And anything you like, you'll call me, and I'll talk to you on the phone. But I have to get back to my appointment. So we flew back to New York Thursday night to Red Eye. You get, to, you get to New York uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, whatever. So now, Friday comes. Friday night comes. I don't hear from her. Friday night we have dinner. I go upstairs to my bedroom. The phone is ringing. The phone is ringing. I look on the phone, you know. Today you can see who's calling. I look on the phone. Who's calling? Secretary of Princess Nasleen. I look, it's Friday night. I said, Hashem, why do I need this? This is Azeb. You know, she wants to negotiate. She's calling me up. She's not calling for nothing. She wants to buy. I let the phone ring. I go, everybody's sleeping. Half hour later, the phone rings again. I look, Secretary Princess Nasleen. Two hours went by, she called four times. I didn't answer the phone. Shabbat. And I said to Hashem, Hashem, let me answer the phone. I'll take the phone in my bathroom. I'll close the door. My wife is sleeping. Everyone's sleeping. No one's going to hear me. And if I make a sale, I'm going to give Sedakah. And who's going to know? Just me, you, and her. <laughs> let me just push the button and say, hello. And this is what I'm fighting. Now I say, ah, that's stupid. I look again, the phone rings. Princess Nasleen, without the secretary's name, she herself is calling me. I don't answer. A half hour later, she calls again, and she's a princess. She don't have to call me, you know, she has to say. The bottom line is, I'm not that religious. I don't think I'm that religious. So you don't get the wrong idea. The phone is ringing. It's Friday night. I left a million, two million dollars worth of merchandise with the princess in the hotel with the concierge. I told him it's only worth a hundred dollars or something. And so he wouldn't be afraid. And here I could pick up the phone and I could. She's going to say, I'll give you 800. I'll give you. She's going to say something. So I didn't answer the phone. So the next day I'm in shul, I'm thinking Princess Nasleen called me. She, what did she have to do that? So, sure enough, I called the hotel Sunday. Uh, let me speak to the princess, you know, the room. She checked out. She checked out. Okay. The concierge calls me, I have your merchandise in there. What do you want me to do? I could mail it to you. I said, no, no, my, my cousin's coming, he'll pick it up. I'm not going to let him handle $2 million worth of merchandise. She left back to Saudi Arabia. We retrieved the merchandise back to New York. I said to myself, I said to myself, Hashem's going to pay me for this. He's not going to let me go, you know, without getting a reward. Wouldn't you think so? What do you think? Would you think you're going to get rewarded? You didn't break Shabbat. Now, now, what's going to happen is some way, maybe Sashim's going to send another customer for 10 million. Who knows? Anyway, time went by. We never heard from her again. And that's the end of the story. And I say today, Baruch Hashem, let them call on Shabbat. Let them do what they want on Shabbat. Shabbat is for Hashem. Hashem, Hashem gave us a present. The best present in the world. He gave us Shabbat. You guys don't know. If you work, get up in the morning, go to work, get tension, get married, have kids, blah, blah, blah. Your wife, the kids, this, that, the bills. You're going to get so frustrated. You can't wait. The poor people can't wait for Shabbat. The rich people don't want Shabbat to come. They want to keep making more money. But most of the people, they can't wait for Shabbat to come so they could rest. And they have dinner, and they don't think of anything of the week, of business. And if you have that present that Hashem gave you, 
you should really know it's the greatest president in the world. So I know you guys are a little. Uh, Who said that? You asked the question? Yeah, well, what did they ask? Yeah. Oh, what the was the reward? Yeah. Baruch Hashem, I feel like King Khan. I didn't break Shabbat. Let the princes go to Isis there and let them all go kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Baruch Hashem, we're healthy. We have food on the table. What do we care? You're going to go break Shabbat for what? For some Goya that uh, is tempting you? If you know the secret, I want to tell you the secret of this whole a project, the rabbi, I don't think, will ever ask me again about this subject. Hashem, every Rosh Hashanah gives everybody in this room, their mother, their father, their brother, their sister, the whole family, the whole world, every tree, every apple, every animal is judged on Rosh Hashanah. And Hashem says, how much money? What's your name? Avi. Avi what? Danina. How much money Avi Daniel is going to get? So they take out the book. This year, Avi Daniel is going to say, gonna, it's right? Hashem's going to say, I'm going to give Daniel 800,000 this year. I'm, I'm going <laughs> he, to. Okay, I'm going to give him the whole room 800,000. Everyone got the same decree. Now, if you know, if you believe in Hashem, and you believe in Rosh Hashanah, one of the holiest days of the year, and you believe you're getting judged, you should know you got 800,000 coming. It's like a bank telling you, no problem, you got $800,000 credit here. But don't pick it up on Shabbat. You can pick it up Sunday to Friday. That's okay. Now the guy who goes in the bank on Shabbat to pick up that money to draw out, he's drawing from the 800,000. He's not drawing another 50,000. He's not getting 850,000. So if you take that money on Shabbat, you're stealing. You're stealing it from Hashem's promise, and also you're stealing it from yourself because now you're minus. Now you took 50,000, and now what does it say? The curses start coming. You should have doctor bills, this, that. The money's tamar. There's no bit of hair. You understand what we're talking about here? Hello. Does anybody understand? Yeah. You, you can't, why you want to touch the money on Shabbat? Listen to me. We have a store retail. It's the worst. It's like almost a, it's a curse. Really. We have a store. Now, last week, next door to our store is Santa Claus. A regular guy with a uniform. All the boy you come with the kids taking pictures with this Santa Claus guy. And they're paying up to $100 for a picture. It costs $5, the whole thing. $100 a package. And all the boy you come, they want to take a picture with Santa Claus. So now I had a little uh, beard when I came from Israel. So Santa Claus saw me. He says, uh, are you trying to give me competition? You know, <laughs> so I said, no, I don't have your belly yet. But anyway, the bottom line is, he told me, this Shabbos, you know, next Shabbos, is going to be the biggest Shabbos of the whole year with business. We're going to be so busy, which was last week. And sure enough, People were saying, when is the store open? They went to the, door, the stores next door. They went to the management. When is that store opening? We want to buy something there. And we're closed. You know what it is to come Sunday, and after you hear all this, people are dying to get in your store, and now Sunday nobody's walking in? You know, you got to have, you got to have Imunah. And that's the greatest thing to do. You have to have Imunah in what Hashem is saying, and especially you guys have to have respect for your rabbi. I don't know how you can get away with it. But you have to understand he's only looking after your benefit. He's only trying to help you. Always there's some wise guys in the class who give him a smack. Halloweny over here, whenever he is with the thing in his mouth. <laughs> but even he, you know what? He could be a, maybe a tremendous businessman. You don't know. Nobody knows who's the billionaire. Nobody knows who, who's the guy that pushed the button. Who, who's the Balcora? Who's the rabbi? Who's the student? Who's the computer expert? So anyway, with that, we want to say uh, thank you for listening. We, it's a pleasure to come here. And the rabbis, uh, rabbi, uh, go back to Israel soon. We'd like to ask one favor. Just one favor. Can we dive in please? That's it.